Welcome back to my calculus series. This is the second video where we'll dive into Newton's geometric calculus. In the first video, we explored Leibniz's calculus and used it to differentiate a couple of trig functions and some polynomials. I referred to Leibniz's calculus as the third calculus, with the first being Eudoxus's method of exhaustion and the second being Newton's analytical or symbolic calculus. Today, I'll share my interpretation of Newton's geometric calculus, which I called the fourth calculus in the previous video. Trigger warning, as a physicist who embraces the motto, just as in street fighting, rules are for fools, I won't be employing any rigorous proofs here. Newton's original calculus was a little different from what we use today. It was primarily a symbolic calculus, relying heavily on power series manipulation. Sometimes this is called his analytical calculus. While Newton was familiar with Leibniz's notation, which is now standard in modern calculus, he seemed very uninterested. Around 1680, Newton developed his second form of calculus, a geometric calculus, sometimes called synthetic calculus. He used this calculus to present his universal law of gravitation and his three laws in the Principia. Unlike his earlier symbolic calculus, this geometric calculus would have been understandable even to Euclid. Newton may have chosen this approach to avoid overwhelming his audience with both new science and new mathematics, or perhaps he was just disillusioned with the algebraic methods that were popular at the time. It is alleged that he was a bit of an anti-modernist. Interestingly, geometric methods are experiencing a resurgence today. After my recent deep dive into Newton's Principia, I share this enthusiasm. In this video, I will emulate Newton's method of synthetic calculus to derive the derivatives of the three main trigonometric functions. We will begin with the sine of theta. Let's start by constructing a right triangle within a unit circle. Imagine the radius of the circle making an angle theta with the horizontal axis. Let's label the horizontal leg as the square root of 1 minus L squared, where L is the length of the vertical leg. Therefore, according to trigonometric definitions, the sine of angle theta is equal to L over 1, or simply L. If we draw a second unit radius, creating a larger angle, we can denote the increase in angle as delta theta. Now imagine drawing a horizontal line through the point where the radius forming the larger angle meets the circle circumference. Also draw another line from this point to where the original radius meets the circumference. Finally, extend the vertical leg of length L by an amount dL meeting the horizontal line from before, forming a tiny right triangle on the circle's edge. As the angle delta theta becomes smaller and smaller, approaching zero, this tiny triangle starts to resemble our initial right triangle more closely. We'll refer to the hypotenuse of this small triangle as d theta because in the limit, the arc length approaches the chord. By rotating this small triangle 90 degrees and overlaying it onto the original right triangle, you can see their similarity more clearly. Furthermore, as d theta shrinks to an infinitesimally small value, the hypotenuse begins to align with the tangent line at the circle's edge, which is perpendicular to the radius that formed our original angle theta. This concept is fundamental in understanding how differential elements in calculus behave. Due to the triangle's similarity, we can compare their corresponding sides the ratio dl to d theta in the small triangle can be equated to the ratio of the corresponding sides in the original triangle. Importantly, thinking of d over d theta as an operator, which operates on l in this case, we can replace the left-hand side of the equation by d over d theta of sine theta. Since the horizontal leg of the original triangle is the square root of 1 minus L squared, the ratio dL over d theta equals this value divided by 1. This ratio, importantly, represents the cosine of theta in the original triangle. Equating the left and right sides, the derivative of the sine of theta is equal to the cosine of theta. To understand how the derivative of the cosine function relates to the sine, let's adjust our perspective on the original triangle within the unit circle. We'll switch the labels for the horizontal and vertical legs. Now the cosine of theta is represented by L over 1, or simply L. 
and the sine of theta becomes the square root of 1 squared minus L squared over 1. In the tiny triangle formed as d theta approaches 0, the horizontal leg changes by minus dl, indicating a decrease, while the hypotenuse is still d theta. By the principles of similar triangles, as before, the ratio of dl to d theta, moving the negative to the other side, equals negative the square root of 1 squared minus l squared over 1. which corresponds to minus the sine of theta in our original configuration. The ratio dl d theta is essentially the derivative of the cosine of theta with respect to theta. Hence the derivative of the cosine function is minus sine theta. This connection is a fundamental aspect of calculus, linking the rate of change of the cosine function to the sine function but with a negative sign. Thus we've used the properties of similar triangles and limits to relate small changes in the links of the sides of a triangle, dl and d theta, to the trigonometric function sine and cosine. Finally, let's find the derivative of the tangent. We need to adjust the labels once again. This time, instead of using a unit circle, we use a circle with a radius of h. We can again construct a triangle out of a radius. If the horizontal leg has a length of 1, and the vertical leg has a length of L, then the radius, which we called h, is equal to the square root of 1 squared plus L squared. That's just the Pythagorean theorem. Like before, we will add a second radius, making a slightly greater angle to the horizontal. However, we will use a different small triangle than before for this derivation. If we drop a perpendicular from the second radius to the point where the first radius meets the circumference, then we can construct this right triangle. The hypotenuse of this small triangle becomes dl in the limit, and the perpendicular has a length of h d theta. This small triangle is also similar to the original triangle as d theta approaches 0. By this similarity, the ratio of h over 1 is equal to the ratio dl over h d theta. Cross multiplying by h, we can solve for the derivative of the tangent. L over 1 is just equal to the tangent, and h squared is equal to 1 plus l squared. But since l over 1 is equal to the tangent of theta, this is just equal to 1 plus the tangent squared of theta. Let's verify this result using symbolic calculus. The derivatives of the sine and cosine are easy enough, but the derivative of the tangent is a bit tricky. We could, of course, look it up, but if we rewrite the tangent as the sine over the cosine, then we can use a combination of the product rule and chain rule to easily derive the derivative of the tangent. The derivative of f times g to the minus 1 is equal to f prime over g minus f times g prime over g squared. This is the same thing as f prime g minus g prime f, all divided by g squared. With f equals sine theta and g equals cosine theta, then f prime is equal to the cosine of theta, and g prime is equal to minus sine theta. Substituting this into the quotient rule, we get that the derivative of the tangent is cosine squared of theta plus sine squared of theta, all divided by cosine squared of theta. Dividing through both terms by the cosine squared, we get 1 plus the tangent squared thus confirming our geometric result. Thank you for watching. I hope this video helped you understand Newton's geometric calculus and how it applies to trigonometric functions like sine, cosine, and tangent of theta. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below. And don't forget to like and subscribe for more content.